The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. Listen to the conversation between Bob Wills, who is a foreign student advisor at a language school, and Angela Tung, who is a student, and complete the form. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 8 on the form now. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 8. Hello, Foreign Student Advisors Office. This is Bob Wills speaking. Can I help you? It's Angela Tung here, Bob. I'd like to make a request for special leave. Can I do that over the phone? Hello, Angela. You can make that request by phone, but I'll have to fill the form out. Let me get the special leave form. OK, here it is. Mm. Tell me your student number, please. It's H for Harry, 5712. H, 5712. OK. What's your address, Angela? I live at 10 Bridge Street, Tamworth. 10 Bridge Street, Tamworth. And your phone number? The telephone number is 81067455. Thanks. What course are you doing? I'm in the writing class. Writing. Who's your teacher this term? Mrs Green. She spells her name like the colour. Thanks. Hmm... When does your student visa expire? Let me look. July 15. July 15. OK. Which term do you want to take leave? Do you want dates? First, I have to write a term number. When do you want to take leave? In term one. OK. Term one. Now, can you tell me what are the exact dates? I'd like to be away May 31 to June 4. OK, I've got that. You'll miss four working days between May 31 and June 4. Is that right? Only three. I'll be away over a weekend. I'll be back at my classes on June 5, so that's three days away. Look at questions 9 to 12. Now listen to more of the conversation between Angela and Bob. Why do you want to take leave, Angela? I'm going to visit my Aunt May. She's my mother's sister. She and her husband are my guardians while I'm here. Where do they live? About 50 kilometres from here, near Armadale. Do you have to take so long if they live nearby? My mother is coming with me. She's come for a holiday, so she wants to have some time with May. And I want to spend some time with my mother, too. Aren't you going home soon? I've applied to extend my time here. I expect to go home in 12 months. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. 
You will hear someone talking about travelling around New Zealand. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. When thinking about beautiful countryside or stunning views, it has long been accepted that Australia and New Zealand have few equals. What is perhaps slightly less well known is what these countries can offer to the avid train enthusiast. Both countries have railways which pass through breathtaking scenery in the utmost of comfort. In New Zealand, you can travel from the country's biggest city, Auckland, to where a third of the population lives, its capital, Wellington, on the longest passenger rail service in the country, the Overlander. Crossing 681 kilometres, the train winds through the lush farmland of the Waikato and up the Raurumu Spiral onto an amazing volcanic plateau surrounded by native bush. On a clear day, you will be able to see three of New Zealand's most famous volcanoes, Mount Ruapehu, Mount Narahoe, and Mount Tongariro. The whole journey can be completed in 11 hours, but for those keen to see a little more of the country, the trip can be extended over three or four days. This gives travellers the opportunity of seeing the famous Waitomo Caves, relaxing in the mud pools of Rotorua, or skydiving over Lake Taupo. Moving on to the South Island, you can take the Transalpine through the Southern Alps, travelling from the South Pacific Ocean to the Tasman Sea. Climbing from Christchurch right into the Alps, this 223km trip is particularly impressive as the train passes through 16 tunnels before descending to Greymouth at the end of the line. Taking only 5 hours, this is a relatively short trip, but it is worth noting that this journey has been listed as the sixth most scenic rail route in the world. For those that are not so keen on mountains, the South Island has a second option, the Transcoastal. With the sea on one side and the mountains on the other, it again shows some of the best scenery New Zealand has to offer. Also taking five hours, one of the highlights of this journey is the opportunities for whale watching. The fortunate few that see whales are well rewarded, but there are more common sights which are just as enjoyable, such as penguins and seals. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Although these three train journeys are undeniably breathtaking, some travellers prefer the longer journeys on offer in Australia. The Indian Pacific, for example, which travels from Sydney through to Perth and has been dubbed the adventure that spans Australia. With three nights on board, the train takes in the Blue Mountains and the Nullarbor Plains and, as the name implies, the Indian Pacific shows you two oceans. This train journey holds two world records. Covering 4,352 kilometres, it is one of the world's longest train journeys. It also travels the world's longest straight stretch of railway track, 478 kilometres. For those who find these distances a little daunting, passengers can stretch their legs at a number of different stops, such as Kalgoorlie, famous for gold, and Broken Hill, first founded as a silver mine. If three days on board a train seems a little excessive, there are alternatives. 
the Garn, for example, which travels from Adelaide in the south to Alice Springs in the centre of the continent, taking 20 hours. Passing through Crystal Brook, Port Augusta and Woomera, this journey gives an indication of what life was like for the earlier settlers as they discovered the country. Along the way, you can also see the Iron Man sculpture, which was constructed by railway workers to commemorate the one millionth concrete sleeper laid during the construction of the line. Finally, just a quick word about the Overland, which runs between Melbourne and Adelaide. As the first train to travel between the capitals of two states, it is a historic as well as relaxing way to travel, and is famous for being the oldest long-distance train journey on the continent. With so many memorable journeys to choose from, the only problem you will have is knowing which one to do first. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between two work colleagues and their manager about the restructuring of their company. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in, both of you. I believe you wanted to talk to me about something, is that right? Yes. Basically, all the staff are concerned about what the restructuring of the company is going to mean for them. None more so than myself and Nam, as we are the newest members. Oh, as I said to all staff at the meeting last week, there's no cause for concern. There will be no compulsory redundancies. All redundancies will be on a voluntary basis. Yes, we, we understand that. But to tell the truth, we just want a little reassurance that our jobs are safe. Look, Anne and Penny, the company isn't going to be short-sighted and let its bright young minds go. Besides, we've already met our target for the number of voluntary redundancies we want to secure. In fact, there's a waiting list. You know as well as I do that the age profile of staff at this company needs to come down. A lot of our employees are close to retirement age and are just going through the motions until they can take their pensions. That's why we decided on this redundancy initiative. We want to encourage those that would be happy to leave to do so and employ younger, more motivated staff. I guess that makes us feel a little better. But we're also worried about the upcoming salary review. What will it mean for us? Given the fact that the company's motivation for this restructuring initiative is not to cut costs, one again, you needn't be worried that there will be a negative effect on your salaries. We are running a very profitable business and we will reward our top performers in the upcoming review. Both of you fall into that category so you can expect a healthy bonus and salary increase. Simple as that. That's good to know. Another thing on our minds was the fact that with all these voluntary redundancies happening in the next few months, there will be a lot of positions opening up higher in the company. What we were wondering is, will the recruitment drive be an internal or an external one? Obviously, we will recruit internally where possible. That has always been company policy. So, if you're asking me will there be opportunities to gain a promotion in the near future, then the answer is very definitely yes. The type of candidate we would be looking for has a proven track record and is performance-driven. 
How can we improve our chances of getting promoted then when the opportunity arises? Well, in the meantime, be prepared to take on additional responsibilities, especially those relating to the management of other members of staff. Obviously, the higher up you go in the company, the more involved you'll be in managing people. What the management team is looking for then is proof that you can work effectively with and manage other members of staff. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. One more thing. Go on. This project you've given us to manage, is it a test of our abilities? I guess you could say it is a test of sorts, but look at it more as a chance for you to prove yourselves. Actually, now that I have you both here in private, can we talk about that a bit? Of course. OK. Penny. Let's start with you. Has the timescale been agreed yet? Yes. You said we have a total of eight weeks to bring the product to launch. So we've decided to allocate three weeks at the beginning to product research and prototype testing. Very good. Then after that, we are going to spend a further three weeks formulating our marketing strategy and doing some research and testing on a sample of the target market itself to get some feedback. And presumably the last two weeks will be devoted to the launch? Exactly. Now, let's talk estimated costs. Well, you've given us a total budget of £100,000. Of that, we're allocating 50% to product development and testing a further 25% to marketing, and £25,000 will be spent on the launch. Penny, give me a breakdown of the launch costs, would you? Sure. £10,000 will be spent on hiring and decorating the venue, £10,000 will be spent on promotional work, and the remaining money will be used to pay for catering and administrative costs. Uh, I'm very happy with that, to be honest. As I said... You guys should stop worrying. You're doing a fantastic job, so keep it up. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about philosophy. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Most of you, I hope, uh, will be familiar with the name Socrates. 
the ancient Greek philosopher, is perhaps one of the most admired people in history. Socrates led a very noble life. He was, I suppose you could say, an optimist, who believed in the good of mankind. According to Socrates, human nature leads people to act correctly and in agreement with knowledge. Socrates believed that evil and wrong actions arise out of ignorance and is famously quoted as saying, no man knowingly does evil. But true to his personal beliefs, Socrates devoted his own life to seeking goodness and truth. Born in Athens, where he lived all his life, Socrates always dressed simply and was known for moderation in both eating and drinking. He brought his teachings to the masses, speaking regularly in public places such as the busy streets of Athens, especially in the area around its great marketplace. He had little regard for public opinion and always conducted himself in accordance with his own set of rules. Socrates built up a reasonably large following of Athenians looking to learn from his seemingly endless wisdom. But he also had a good many enemies who mistrusted him on account of his unorthodox views on subjects such as religion. Socrates' enemies were what you would call the wrong type of enemy, being powerful and influential Athenians. Their efforts to have him ruined saw him brought to trial on charges of corrupting the young and disrespecting religious traditions. In the trial, Socrates defended himself, claiming that he had done nothing more sinister than enlighten people with a clearer knowledge of the truth, which is essential for the correct conduct of life. He made some remarks aimed at the ruling establishment, uh, suggesting that those who are elected are not necessarily fit to govern effectively. Socrates himself had long ago become disenchanted with the materialistic ways of the upper class. Unfortunately, his views were seen as an attack on democracy and the electoral process, so the jury found Socrates guilty as charged and sentenced him to death. It is thought that many members of the jury resented his unbending pride and that this may explain the harshness of the punishment handed down to him. Despite being given several opportunities to escape prison, Socrates resisted and carried out his sentence calmly by drinking a cup of hemlock poison. During his life, Socrates introduced the idea that there are a set of universal standards by which people should be judged. His method, known as the Socratic method, involved discussion between two or more people around some key term. In theory, those party to the discussion should all define the term in the same manner. However, his studies found that this was seldom the case. Socrates encouraged his followers to engage in such discussions with the goal of trying to proceed from less adequate definitions to more accurate definitions over time the ultimate goal being a true and universal definition that could not be contradicted by anyone. This method tended to expose the ignorance of the Athenians of his day. It showed that many things that they assumed true were in fact false. Socrates also used irony to expose people's ignorance of key concepts. That is, he claimed to differ from others in recognizing that he himself was ignorant. His insistence on ignorance reminded other people of their own ignorance, but won him few friends in high places. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.